Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Dong Hoon Choi from chair, uh, moderator of this session, and my co-chair is uh, Lawrence Garcia from uh, United States. And uh, this, uh, this session is uh, hot topics for EBA, TEBA, and peripheral in interventions. And uh, I'd like to introduce the first speaker. Mm. The first speaker is. Uh, Ah, and uh, I, I'd like to introduce first the panelist, Paul Cham, William Gray, Youngguk Go, Michael S. Lee, and Simon Lo, uh, Taekyu Park, and uh, Junichi Tajaki. First speaker is Youngguk Go from Severance Hospital, Seoul, Korea, and uh, his topic is, uh, is EVA safe? and durable in a long term. Dr. Go, please. Yeah, uh, I'm Yonggu Go. Uh, this is a difficult question. So these are my disclosures. Yeah, I'd like to uh, share my case. Uh, this is 66-year-old male. He had, uh, been, he had been treated with EVA uh, more than 10 years ago. And then after 10 years, he developed, uh, he showed, you know, sec, uh, aneurysm sac growth, and he underwent uh, a second intervention and then after that, still, the sac shows the further expansion. So this patient required another uh, re-intervention. Another patient, 75-year-old male, and he had, also, he had been also treated with uh, EVA, and he already had uh, a second procedure, but the uh, sac, uh, sac shows a further expansion. So this patient also required a uh, third intervention. So uh, this is EVA-1 uh, trial, uh, and 15-year uh, follow-up uh, of these uh, study patients were published, was published in uh, 2016. And as you can see here on this graph, the total survival and the aneurysm-related survival showed no significant difference between the EVA and uh, open repair group. However, when we break down the follow-up duration into you know, time segments, then we can see there is uh, Benefit, there is a uh, <clears throat> lower mortality and aneurysm related mortality uh, at six months uh, in favor of uh, EVA. However, after beyond four or eight years, there is increased risk of uh, aneurysm related mortality or total mortality. So, uh, however, the, the intervention rates are lower, the, the intervention rates are higher uh, in the EVA group uh, compared to open repair. Uh, this is well known. Uh, uh, data and another this is a meta-analysis uh, published in 2020 and this study shows also similar finding the short-term uh, for the short-term follow-up the EVA shows a lower uh, aneurysm related mortality however beyond four or eight years the, the, aneurysm, the EVA shows higher uh, aneurysm related mortality um, so this is uh, the engaged registry. This is a multi international multi-center single arm trial uh, using uh, endurance device. I think it is the most uh, commonly used device worldwide. So using uh, the Medtronic uh, endurance device, uh, this study investigated the long-term outcome. And uh, initially the study designed a five-year uh, follow-up. However, the study extended uh, the follow-up for uh, 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 for a uh, small patients group, and almost uh, 400 patients were followed for 10 years. And definitely the uh, extended follow-up group showed uh, uh, favorable, uh, the less uh, comorbidity compared to uh, initial group. So, the, uh, we can, so this, because of that, uh, we may say the extended follow-up group does not represent the whole population. However, uh, the 10-year data is rare in, this, in these days. This, according to this data, freedom from all cause mortality through 10 years was about 40%. Uh, uh, so that, that means 60% of patients died during the follow-up. So these patients are elderly patients. This is reasonable. However, the freedom from aneurysm-related mortality through 10 years is over 90%, almost 95%. I think this is uh, excellent. Uh, outcome, and the uh, freedom from aneurysm-related reintervention through 10 years is about uh, 70%. So about 30% of patients require intervention during the follow-up. 
And the most common endo leaks uh, found during the follow-up is type 2 endo leak. And uh, like uh, type 1 A or B uh, endo leaks is around 1 to uh, 2 percent. Uh, and however, when you follow this patient longer, then the percentage of type 1 endo leak increases. Uh, however, still, the type 2 endo leak is the, the most common endo leak we found on, during the follow-up. And uh, this is the reasons for intervention. Um, so in early phase, um, the most common cause of the early intervention is type 2 endoleak, followed by graft occlusion and type 1B endoleak. For, but for the uh, late phase, uh, the reasons for, late, uh, in, for the intervention uh, is uh, type 1 endoleak and type 2. And uh, so this proportion, the type 1 endoleak, uh, is increases during time. And the graft occlusion risk is very low. The, the complication related to device, uh, such as um, uh, main body migration, is relatively rare. And also, stent graft occlusion is uh, low, uh, the risk of the stent graft occlusion is also low with long term follow up. Uh, aneurysm rupture is also very rare. There was uh, several cases, but most of uh, the reason of the uh, rupture was type 1 uh, and type 3 end leaks. And interestingly, uh, during follow up, um, the sec regression was found up to 66% uh, of cases, and the rate of uh, the proportion of the patients with sec regression uh, remains stable after three years, so up to you know 66%. So that means these patients remain very stable. So it is very important to achieve sec regression during follow-up. So another this study, uh, interesting, this study compared. The, the, the population of uh, EVA1, uh, EVA group, and uh, engage um, uh, study population. So this is not direct comparison. However, it's interestingly, the aneurysm-related mortality decreased uh, from 4% to 2%. Um, EVA1, uh, in EVA1 trial, various devices were uh, used. Many of them are not used anymore. And then the engaged study, only endurant is uh, uh, adopted uh, for the procedure. This is U.S. Medicare data. Uh, they had uh, patients, more than uh, 30,000 patients, and they had a pros uh, propensity score matching. And uh, uh, due to their analysis, uh, the open repair showed a higher, significantly higher uh, survival from all cause mortality and rupture and uh, aneurysm related reintervention. So that means uh, EVA performs very poorly. Uh, and uh, open, they also re compared early phase EVA and early phase, recent phase EVA, and there was no significant difference between two uh, time phases. Uh, adherence to IFU is very important. Uh, uh, outside the IFU uh, shows a poor outcome. And uh, the aortic neck angulation and neck diameter are important factor for the type 1 endoleak and the sac expansion and uh, reintervention. And uh, the aortic neck shows uh, a pro progressive uh, dilation during the follow-up. And we also uh, checked uh, the uh, out clinical outcomes of patients treated EVA within the IFU and outside the IFU. And the, uh, the, uh, according to our data, the, the patients within the IFU showed uh, uh, better survival uh, from uh, graft-related adverse events, and uh, the uh, IFU group showed the less uh, event of uh, type 1 or type 3 endoleak, and reintervention, aneurysm-related mortality, say enlargement, uh, showed more frequently in the IF outside IFU group. And uh, the neck angle uh, is an important uh, risk factor, along with uh, neck length less than 10 millimeter. And uh, this uh, shows the comparison between uh, open repair and uh, open conversion. So primary open repair and uh, open conversion after EVA. And this shows uh, the open conversion after EVA sh uh, performs poorly uh, in comparison with the primary open repair. So uh, we have to, when the patient requires treatment, then maybe primary open repair is better than, uh, you know, failed uh, surgery after failed EVA. And when we uh, break down the patient age into several groups, uh, then actually for the ages between 65 and 
uh, 80. Uh, the EVA and uh, open repair showed uh, similar performance. However, in patients with the, uh, age lower than 65, then uh, open repair is better. However, for the age over 80, uh, then EVA is better. So these are my take-home messages. Uh, recent studies demonstrated aneurysm-related mortality during long-term follow-up is higher with EVA, uh, uh, despite re reduced 30-day uh, mortality and perioperative morbidity after EVA. Current generation EVA device may uh, have improved the clinical outcomes compared to all generation devices. However, non-adherence to IFU was associated with increased incidence of reinterventions and aneurysm-related mortality after EVA. Thus, EVA should be primarily indicated for patients within IFU over 65 years and patients at high surgical risk. Open repair should be considered for younger patients and patients outside IFU uh, as a primary therapy. Regular surveillance after EVA is important to detect uh, early unfortunate, uh, unfavorable adverse changes in the sac and implants after EVA. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Go. Uh, next speaker will be announced, uh, Garcia, please. Uh, next, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Choi. Uh, next speaker will be uh, Dr. Lee out of the Busan National University here in Korea. Uh, similar title, but just a different location. TVAR, is it durable and safe? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's my great pleasure to give a presentation in this uh, seminar. <clears throat> Today's topic is TIVA durability. What kind of issue is more related to durability of TIVA is first patient-related issue, for instance, the aging process, aortic anatomy and angulation, and CNA in especially acute aortic dissection. And another is stent graft-related issue is durability of graft tear and migration, retinol and stainless issue. I'm going to show you our case. So it's a chronic type B aortic dissection. And uh, this patient has uh, smoking, hypertension, DM, especially AG, is uh, 69 years old. So is a CT, we checked the CT in 2008, and the chronic, as you see, is a chronic aortic dissection intima tear here. And true lumen and pulse lumen. True lumen, pulse lumen is a huge aneurysm. We met in that kind of case, we always talk about endovascular treatment and operation. So, and then advantage of TIVA is effective and very safe. And the short procedure time and easy, low early mortality is a great benefit, especially old age patients with many comorbidity. Our concept is now I am happy, our happy, because safe and easy. But I don't know in the future, uh, so is we don't know the long term. So is uh, we we have performed the TIVA in the 2008. So like this, uh, simple is it's about uh, 30 minutes. And then we check the city is very nice, uh, 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 as we expect. Uh, so is uh, there is uh, absolutely no aortic remodeling and uh, to prevent uh, the rupture. Uh, according to cerebral data, most of the data is uh, registry data. The long-term clinical outcome is uh, about uh, like this. And then uh, five-year data is aorta-related mortality is uh, 80 and 19. And then uh, in, in that case, is aortic dissection is uh, five years is uh, 50 and 70 is variable. So it's about five-year survival rate is like this and the five-year freedom from aortic age is 45 and 70 is a variable data. Uh, but in case of uncomplicated type aortic dissection, according to the ELAD data, is uh, extremely low, uh, very low. TBA is uh, five year mortality is 11%. And uh, according to the instead XR, as you know, is five year data is very low, is uh, 6.9. But it is uh, uncomplicated aortic dissection. So uh, most of the data is uh, uh, observation data, and this is another observation data about the thoracic aortic aneurysm is uh, on values and the descending thoracic aortic aneurysm, including left subclavian artery to rest bypass operation just. Uh, 
it is difficult to make the randomized study about uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm. So the situation is very variable. Uh, 12 years follow-up is uh, more than 500 patients, and the uh, aortic rupture is very low. Two endoric is uh, 14 patients, and then especially uh, public problem, uh, device problem type 3 is very low, and then aortic specific mortality is 96.2. Is like this, and they use the all kind of device. A particular test guaranteed is ten years. FDA and the Korean FDA required the particular test is guaranteed ten years. So is and the advantage of TBA is aorta is not straight, is is very angulated and the tortoise and then. Variable design. So, and then shear stress of blood is uh, and and many point. So, as you know, is a blood big is a serious problem. Make the uh, retrograde aortic dissection and the graft tear and the graft plaque migration. There are many problem. In this patient, is a stain graft in this scene like this, and then. In this patient, uh, after TIVA, seven after seven years, uh, distal aortic aneurysm like this. And then another problem is aging processes. Aortic angulation change on CT after eight years. Uh, after TIVA is a very straight uh, form, but and then uh, progress the angulation in six after six years, and then. Uh, finally, 8A, this patient, angulation, angulation is extremely severe and then to disconnect the uh, uh, frame of a stain graft. So we return to the first case and then we, we have a Riteva in 2011 and the epithe three years. It is the, because of this cine and it, it, uh, procedure is very simple. And then in this patient, uh, 2019, age is 18. So check the CT and they redeveloped the scene like this. And uh, so we have done TIVA again, third TIVA. And then the process is very simple. So now uh, we check the 2021. Uh, this patient is alive now and the age is 82. And like this is a good result. This is uh, small hour data, is a middle-term clinical outcome of descending aortic disease, especially in mild perfusion syndrome, complicated cases. So is mild perfusion case is rare. So is uh, uh, 27 patients involved with the visceral, renal, ileo, and the combined with the patient. Uh, duration from admission to procedure 5.5 days. So emergency situations, type of, of a procedure we primarily selected the TIVA, TIVA but, and then uh, we check the autography after 10 minutes or 20 minutes, and then if we detected uh, compromised artery and the selective stenting. So, and sometimes uh, in a in, uh, unavoidable case, uh, it is impossible to TIVA procedure we selective we we have done selective stenting is a two twenty percent. Primary technical success is one hundred percent, and the mean power of duration is uh, about the four years. Death is zero, endoric is zero, and reintervention rate is seven uh, percent. So survival curve is like this, and then uh, especially it is slightly interesting to us and. Uh, we, ch we check the uh, baseline CT after TIVA and then compare with the three years uh, CT scan. So we, we measure the area and the true lumen area and the diameter of a pulse lumen. And then uh, we divided the two groups, TIVA group and the selective stenting, selective stenting only group. And, and then TIVA group is favorable, favorable to remodeling. And we divided the TIVA group and selective stenting group, and then we added the combined the group and the uh, TIVA plus selective stenting group. And aortic area and the uh, aortic area lumen diameter is uh, so. Combined the group 
in some there between TIVA and the selective stenting about the remodeling. So we illustrated uh, this result. Uh, so is uh, selective stenting only for the compromised artery is uh, it might be related to the uh, blood leakage through the uh, from bare stent to the pulse lumen and uh, TIVA selected stent uh, group is a small amount of blood leakage to the from bare metal stent to pulse lumen. TIVA only is the best result for remodeling. So this is our result. I'm going to summarize my lecture is long-term durability of TIVA. TIVA is very simple and easy and low, early complicated rate. It is very strong point and then According to the many registered long-term data is not bad. Is uh, aneurysm is less than five percent. Uncomplicated is uh, nice. Is less than ten percent. Complicated is not good, and and about seventy percent. But re-intervention rates are more frequent, and uh, and most of the TIBA issues are is is are related to the patient factor, not the device factor. So is a uh, angulation is a kind of a patient factor. So TIVA is useful, especially in the as you know, is old age patient with uh, many comorbidity. More innovative device will be devised. At this time, uh, we should do repair, repair, repair up to average patient life expectancy. Uh, it is uh, just kind of a Korean joke, uh, according to the Warren Buffett only jumbo is a right way. So is a jumbo mean is a persist patiently for long lifetime. Okay, thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, I'd like to introduce the uh, third speaker and uh, uh, Seok Won Song, Iwa Women's University, Seoul, Korea. His topic is uh, uh, first room management in chronic type 3B aortic dissection. Dr. Song, please. Thank you, Professor Choi. Um, I'm So Won Song and working with uh, Kwang Hun Lee. He is an uh, interventional radiologist working with me more than 15 years. Uh, my topic is the first lumen management of chronic type 3B aortic dissection. As you know, the um, only simple T-bar for chronic type 3 aortic dissection, uh, the 65%, only 65% had a uh, complete thrombosis of the first lumen at the stented level, if you, although you do the supracelliac level. And it, this is our published data of the uh, prognostic factor of the CD3B aneurysms. If you, if uh, there are remnant uh, visceral reentry tears below the stand graft, there is a risk of factors of the non-favorable aortic remodeling. Also, the many segmental arteries originating from the first lumen also uh, make a, a unfavorable aortic remodeling. So the simple T-bar for chronic type 3 aortic dissection has many limitations. Uh, so we need adjunctive technique uh, uh, to the simple TVAR procedures. So these are uh, materials we use usually during the first lumen procedures, in other words, stainless TVAR. Sometimes we use an amplitude vascular plug, sometimes you use a coil, sometimes we use a glue and mix of all the three materials. These um, amplitude vascular plug type two and four to include the reentry tears or primary uh, entry tears. So in a, for example, we use um, type two amplitude vascular plug in the primary tear in the proximal DTA and after that, uh, we use uh, multiple coils around the amplitude vessel plug uh, to completely occlude the uh, primary entry tears. I will show them this case. This is a 59-year-old female uh, with a back pain uh, for three days, had a history of uh, type A aortic dissection repair, and she had a uh, severe tricuspid regurgitation. So as you see the CD scans, there are huge um, descending thoracic aortic aneurysm, more than 70 millimeter, and there are big uh, 
severe tricuspid with regurgitation. So in this patient, when you see the Sastar view of the CD scans, you can see that there are uh, re-entry tears in the uh, left subclavian artery, and another tear is located in the left renal artery. And also there are multiple re-entry tears below the renal arteries flaps. So there are force men, uh, pressure is very high from the left subclavian uh, artery tears and left renal artery tears. But uh, unfortunately, the patient was ruptured uh, during the follow-up period with a huge left hemothorax, and the diameter was increased to 71 millimeter. And so in this patient, we decided to the endovascular treatment. The first thing we do was um, left subclavian artery occlusion with um, amplitude vascular plug 12 millimeter and uh, also coiling around that. So when you see the first lumen angiogram, there are uh, completely occlusion of the left subclavian artery first lumen. And then we approach to the uh, suprarenal level of the first lumen to occlude it, first lumen itself, with the multiple amplitude vascular plug coils and glues. You can see the uh, first lumen angiogram, there are no backflow or no retrograde backflow to the first lumen uh, when you do the first lumen and aortograms. You can see the final angiogram only shows um, true lumen and no visualization of the first lumen. You can see the chest x-ray at POD1, you can see the POD2, POD5, you see the chest x-ray of 11 uh, post-operative when she was discharged. You can see many amplitude vascular plugs in the left subclavian level and suprarenal abdominal aortic level, first lumen. So this is uh, left initial CT scans, and right side is a two-month follow-up CT scans, and you can see the uh, true lumen is uh, enlarged and the diameter is uh, decreased at every level. This is a 41-year-old male with a CD3B aneurysm. The patient had a type A intramural hematoma after uh, ascending proximal IMH reserved. Uh, we did our first lumen procedures for this patient. You can see the true lumen and first lumen is visualized through the uh, primary vicentry tear. We insert the type 2 and vessel plug. I think it's a 12 2 millimeter diameter. We will follow up the CT scans for this patient. This is a 56-year-old female with an atrial flutter and type A uh, aortic dissection repair. Also uh, shows um, big uh, chronic type 3B aortic aneurysms. You can see there are multiple reentry tears in the uh, intercostal arteries. So uh, we decide to uh, do the first room procedure for this patient, and we insert um, six level um, amplitude vessel plugs. Uh, type 4 plugs. This is um, pre first lumen procedures and aortogram. You can see uh, best visualization of the first lumen, but after procedures, you can, you can see the first lumen flow is very, very decreased. So we have published many reports, and 80% of the patient had a favorable aortic remodeling when we add um, uh, first lumen procedures to TIVA procedures. And also, this is on two years later data, 83% was, uh, first lumen was completely thrombosed compared with um, TVAR only group, the rate was uh, 70, uh, 56%. And also, the first lumen was remodeled very well. And these are our, our recent paper of um, first lumen procedures, about 80% demonstrated thoracic first lumen thrombosis. And you can see we use many amplitude vessel plug, nest the coils, or sometimes we insert them uh, stand grafting to the visceral organs. Uh, the true lumen was increased, and the first lumen was decreased significantly. So this is my conclusion. The first lumen procedures for chronic type 3 aortic dissection uh, result a promising first lumen thrombosis rate and it shows a favorable aortic remodeling with a low incidence of complication with an acceptable re-intervention rate. So this procedure should be considered in patients with a severe comorbidities and could be considered in ruptured case. Thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you, Dr. Song. Uh, next up uh, will be a panel discussion. Um, all these papers are open. Are there any uh, questions for the panel? Dr. Ko, um, at Severance, if somebody comes in with an acute rupture of a AAA, what's the treatment strategy? Are they being referred for endovascular or are they going for open surgery? Uh, uh, you mean a, a rupture? Yeah. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, it depends on who is at service. You know, if the surgeon is available, then he will take the, the patient to the uh, OR. But uh, you know, if the uh, interventionist is uh, you know in ER and will have uh, the patient in the cast room, so it, it's a, the strategy is a little different. You know, the, the, it's a matter of who first see the, the, the patient. Okay, and it, if you do endovascular repair, do you try to keep the map a little bit lower than? the normal, or do you have any treatment strategy in terms of how to manage the blood pressure? Uh, it's, yeah, it's difficult to sit, it's a difficult situation, but you know, uh, we do not try to elevate the blood pressure. If the patient tolerates, then we keep that pressure as it is, and then we quickly try, try to transport the patient to the, the cast room, and then try to insert a balloon caster, and try to occlude the aorta, and then we do the rest of the procedure. Okay. Can I ask uh, Dr. Song, uh, your procedure, you actually enter the first lumen? Yes, yeah, sometimes we enter into the first lumen, sometimes we enter into the true lumen. Because, so, yeah. so you deploy your vascular plug f from the, uh, the distal end, you deploy in the distal, in the first lumen first, or? Yes, or depends usually, on which way you enter. Yes, we usually enter into the true lumen and enter into the primary tear and enter into the first lumen. The oh. destination is the first lumen. And we deploy the um, amplitude vascular plug type 2. Oh. There, you, as you know, the plug is three part. So two parts in the first lumen and the last one part in the true lumen. Uh -huh. And then the distal? Um, distal uh, uh, leaky hole, do you also enter the force lumen and then you just release some coil or wires there? You in mean the, the distal? Distal the part lumen. of the first lumen. Hmm. Yes, some, sometimes we enter into the first lumen to occlude the first lumen itself hmm. because there are many, many reentry tears in the Absolutely. abdomina and iliac trees. Yeah. So uh, there are much, uh, there are very high flow from the below. Mm. So we, in the um, rupture case especially, we should occlude all the first lumen in the distal part. Is there a risk of distal embolization later or never happens? Uh, no, <laughs> sometimes, uh, sometimes there are embolization, uh -huh. but there is no problem. If you uh, put the uh, amplitude vessel plug, a size was 22 milliliter in the distal part of the first, first lumen, uh, sometimes the plug go up to the proximal DTA, huh. but there is no problem. <laughs> you can try another one. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you, uh, in the, sometimes there are multiple tears in the thoracic aorta. Uh, do you have a limit as to how many you're going to approach? I mean, in this technique, do you, do you do them all, or do you say if there's more than some number, I stop? So there are usually multiple tears in the descending thoracic aorta because um, intercostal arteries are detached from the adventitia. So there are pairs in the intercostal uh, reentry tears. So uh, sometimes we just use a um, stand graft there in the true lumen to occlude all the segmental arteries reentry okay. tears. But sometimes you use uh, uh, amplitude vessel type 4 to occlude um, uh, reentry tears. Yeah. It depends on, yeah. Can, can I ask you if, if you have a series of smaller tears or just whatever is connected to the true lumen and normally retrograde dissections generally are not perfused well because the true lumen should be more pressure. But in your work, have you noticed that when you coil more proximally, have you ever seen more tears develop in the distal segment? No, not yet. We didn't see that. How acute are your um, dissections? Are they chronic or acute? We uh, only uh, try to 
did uh, first line procedures for the chronic case because um, uh, we, we never uh, try in the acute case because uh, entry tear is very weak in acute. We cannot... Uh, Can't engage. Yeah, we can engage. That. So how do you define acute? Fa acute? How, many, how many weeks? Um, more than three months. Three months, okay. yeah. How, how did you decide the size of the vascular problem? Yes, uh, there is no uh, guideline to uh, how the size of the device, but we usually double the size. When you measure in the CT scans, yes. uh, the diameter is 8 millimeter. We usually use a 16 millimeter amplitude vessel plug. Uh, when uh, we measure it, uh, one centimeter, we use um, two centimeter diameter of the amplitude vessel plug. In our, in our experience, even patients in chronic dissection, so within maybe one year, they show complete regression of false rumen and uh, you know, shrinkage of the uh, aorta, total aorta size after TIVA. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, occlude the, the, <laughs> the false rumen with you know, uh, you know, uh, plug device, then you know, there may be some problem with that, you know, because you know, there is a device within the you know, false rumen and there will be no total regression. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes, what do you think about that? sometimes when you follow up the CT scans, yeah. uh, there are 22 millimeter diameter of the amplitude vessel plug in the first lumen, but the uh, amplitude vessel plug may be very, very collapsed mm. because that is a very soft. Mm. So we, we sometimes experience the collapsed materials after uh, first lumen thrombosis. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. And let's to the move uh, second session, peripheral intervention issues. And the first speaker is uh, William Gray from Lankanao Heart Institute, Mainline Health, United States. And uh, he'll talk about expert thought on drug relating results of a scaffold for peripheral interventions, dreaming or still crucial. Dr. Gray, please. Thank you. So um, you've heard already uh, Dr. Garcia and others speak uh, to the bioabsorbable uh, technology. And there, there are some, some considerations that need to be um, taken when we're thinking about biodegradable uh, scaffolds. Um, we have to choose the right materials. Uh, right now, most of the technology being tested are polymer-based uh, materials, which are hydrolytic breakdown there are there is a magnetic there are, sorry mag, magnesium uh, alloy from Biotronic which is also being tested. Uh, the first of that was the Igaki Tomai. The mechanical properties are interesting. You have to have enough radial strength to, to do the scaffolding job at the time of the deliver, delivery, but also um, have to have enough scaffolding for a long enough period of time such that uh, you allow healing. And then the de degradation rates, which, which tie into the mechanical properties, um, <clears throat> have to uh, come in a time frame which is relevant, that is within the first couple of years, uh, without overloading the system because all degradation involves inflammation. Why would we consider bioabsorbable stents? Well, in certain uh, territories, uh, there's compression that can be a, uh, part of the uh, uh, consideration for uh, scaffolding. So if you have an external compression, that can be problematic. Uh, there's, no, but th there's no issue with anything being left behind after a period of time. Um, there may be areas where permanent stenting, like for compression, may not be good. Uh, Longer-term dual antiplatelet therapy may not be required. And for stent fracture, as seen here, is uh, not an issue. Some of the disadvantages I've already mentioned, um, and I'm going to go through uh, some of the clinical data now. So, Get, get, grasping some of these potential advantages, uh, Dr. Ramon Varco in Australia took on a, the um, Absorb BTK trial, which is the first in human trial looking at uh, the implantation of a bioabsorbable scaffold from Abbott, and found that in his single center experience, single arm, the primary patency at, at, um, at, uh, at uh, five years was quite good. At, um, uh, 72%, 73%, and freedom from clinically driven TLR over 90%. And that led to a, <coughs> excuse me, a further development of the uh, device uh, for BTK applications specifically, 
with the thinner struts uh, of 99 microns and uh, still made a PLLA with, PL, uh, with PDLLA as a um, carrier for the sirolimus. And then there were four platinum markers uh, to help understand where the device was being implanted. The light BTK trial, is, as um, Lawrence talked about yesterday, was a 260 patient trial, uh, randomized two to one Esprit BTK versus PTA with a primary endpoint of one year, uh, primary, primary safety, uh, efficacy, and secondary powered endpoints. Um, I, I put this in here because I, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later on, but the uh, important inclusion criteria included the proximal two-thirds of the native uh, popliteal arteries. It did not extend into the ankle area. Um, and the total scaffold length was allowed to be something less than 17, uh, 17 centimeters in one lesion or divided between two lesions. And so this is the, the, the population which was allowed into the trial. Now, these are the baseline actual characteristics of the patient that entered in the trial. And although 17 centimeters was allowed, only four centimeters was the average lesion length in both arms. We also see that uh, most of the patients, almost two-thirds to three-quarters of the patients, had none or mild calcification. And as we know, in the BTK space, calcification is the rule, not the exception. And most of these patients, over 80 percent, were at task A or B, so a relatively simple lesion set. I'm not criticizing the trial, but I'm just characterizing what was treated. So the primary, primary efficacy endpoint is seen here, and it was uh, the composite of limb salvage and primary patency at one year, which uh, actually here is at the end of the window at 393 days. And you can see a very significant advantage for the BTK scaffold. If we go to the landmark primary efficacy, this, what this does is it splits the results into the first six months as per the trial, and then starting the clock again at six months and seeing what happens after the time of uh, procedure. And you can see here that separation starts to occur later in the, um, in the uh, endpoint. As uh, Lawrence said, there were some caveats to that. There were a couple uh, failed stents early on. But the bottom line is that, that the major separation does occur uh, in the second six months. Um, a, the powered secondary endpoint, which is binary stenosis, was also very positive for the scaffold and uh, very strongly po uh, statistically significant. And secondary powered endpoint of above, above ankle amputation and uh, lack of target lesion occlusion and target lesion vascularization also very positive for the scaffold. And there's no subgroup in which the scaffold did not show effect. There's no safety issue. Now, that I'm going to talk about these other two uh, scaffolds because I want to wrap it all up to talk about the, the class of scaffolds in a moment because that was the question posed by the, the uh, organizers. So this is the Riva Medical Moto BTK technology. It's already CE marked in Europe. It has very good 24-month data, data. It's received FDA breakthrough uh, technology designation, which allows a more rapid movement to approval. It has a, a proprietary polymer called Tyrocore, which does allow for better X-ray visibility, high strength, and good uh, drug delivery. It's actively enrolling in the US IDE trial. And um, these are the data from coronary uh, in implants. You can see as compared to historical absorbed data that the five-year target lesion failure was uh, about a third of what it was in the, in the uh, previous predicate data sets. And in a small European peripheral vascular trial, you can see that the average Rutherford classification improved significantly over 12 months or sorry, over 24 months. The next steps are that there's actually a trial that's just about to begin with this uh, in the U.S. for an IDE uh, approval, uh, almost 300 patients, and a, a trial is, is starting up. This is the R3 vascular program. Uh, this is also a drug eluting scaffold delivery system, a very uh, low uh, strut thickness, very high radial force, and, um, and balloon expandable. It also has a PDLA, LLA, resorbable coating, which carries the polymer and drug, and the drug is sirolimus. And we can see here a very nice um, reabsorption profile of the magnitude scaffold. And here we have an early feasibility study um, outside the U.S., 50 patients. And now the uh, IDE trial is about to begin, or already beginning in the U.S. Um, it's going to be a prospective multicenter, randomized one-to-one. -one. And I suspect, Lawrence, this will be about 300 patients as well, though it's not listed here. So, in summary, finally, we have a, an effective, dedicated, FDA and CE-marked approved device or devices 
category in scaffolds for below the knee uh, intervention. With two more platfo platforms currently in clinical trials in the U.S., more data and greater options are likely to be forthcoming. But there are other considerations. Quickly, the LIFE BTK BRS trial lesion length was limited in complexity, only 40 to 50 millimeters in length, only the proximal two thirds of the tibials, and 80% were simple lesion by task classification. So, how will the scaffold perform in longer lesions, more complex, and calcified lesions? We don't know. So, there's a data limitation there. What about the cost of BRS? And again, we don't know that yet. It's not available in the US, uh, to my knowledge. The coronary DES in the Europe is 80 euros. Now, that's pretty low, but it might be reasonable alternative to treat proximal short disease, especially if it's calcified, where a scaffold may not be uh, as um, optimal. Other considerations are mortality rates in critical limb patients. Here's Basel II, 40% mortality at four years. Basel III just reported this week, 40% mortality at four years. And best CLI, about 35 to 40% mortality of four years. So the question becomes, with the acknowledged high mortality rates in the CLTI patient population, is a resorbable bio, is a bioresorbable platform a universal solution, or should it be used selectively or complementarily with other approaches? And if so, it appears that there's a need to develop a potential clinical, maybe a Wi-Fi plus clinical data set. Predicate score, a predictive score, sorry, for mortality in these CLTI patients to better customize and justify the device and procedural approaches and associated costs with their care, whatever they are. And here are some of the approaches that we could imagine, all, we, all of which may be um, complementary to a, a scaffold technology. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thanks, Bill. That was a great review. Um, Next up, uh, out of uh, Fukuoka in Japan, is uh, sensei, Yokoi Sensei, who will be talking about uh, Zilver PTX, paclitaxel coated stents, the transparency, data, and patient safety. Thank sensei. you, Lawrence. That, uh, my topic is, uh, talk is not, not so new, that uh, old Zilver PTX, but the, I think the important uh, device is still now. This is uh, uh, <coughs> nothing to disclosure. Today is my talk that the device design and study result, and then the uh, safety uh, concerning, and then finally, uh, the, uh, Dr. Gray uh, say already that the prediction model, I think is very important, uh, and device uh, cost effectiveness. So firstly, device design and study result. As you know, the deliver PT gets the first approved drug eluting device in femoroprocritial field, uh, paclitaxel uh, low dose coating. Uh, Amorphous uh, coating with no polymer or excipient. And sh uh, um, short term drug delivery, no long term paclitaxel exposure, only uh, bare metal stent remains. And then uh, only peripheral DES with long term safety data uh, during five years, most longer. As you know, the randomized trial, the uh, balloon versus Zilva PTX, and then the suboptimal PTA. Uh, provisional BMS, and then the provisional Zilva PTX, second randomization, but very unique design. And then the uh, enrollment with the uh, more than 50, uh, 550 patients, and the randomized and the diabetic patient, 42%. Um, region length are not so long, uh, 63, and then total occlusion, uh, 30%. The noble region, uh, 94%. And then five years and integrity, that's a very important the long-term safety uh, issue. 1.5%, uh, five-year fracture rate, very low. And then the uh, five-year freedom from TL, uh, you can see the five-year Zilva PTX demonstrated that the 48% reduction re-intervention compared to standard of care. Also, the uh, primary patency five-year defined by the, the PSVR less than 2.0, uh, you can see the Zilla PTX 41% uh, reduction in this stenosis compared to standard care. Also, the, compared with the bare metal stent, the, the secondary randomization like this, uh, that, uh, let's compare that uh, Zilla PTX 47% reduction in the intervention compared to BMS. Also, the uh, patency 41% reduction in this stenosis compared to bare metal stent. So next to the uh, safety concerning, 
the Cassano's uh, paper, uh, Great Impact of the uh, Paxitaxel Devices. In Zilba PTX, uh, as you know, the firstly, uh, first randomization balloon versus drug editing stent. And then, but the RCT are not designed to ensure balance across numerous baseline risk factors. Randomization was stratified only by region lengths. So that uh, this is the uh, intention treat data, uh, five-year uh, vital status for 94% of the patient enrolled. Uh, but the drug editing stent patient included in PTA group. Uh, final results are not significant, but the slightly tendency much higher Gilba PTX uh, cohort like this. But the uh, difference may be due to imbalance of risk factor. So the, uh, we uh, analyzed the baseline mortality risk factor. You can see the uh, risk factor common in PAD patient may uh, collectively uh, contribute to overall patient prognosis. Uh, imbalance of risk factor despite randomization. You can see drug editing stent uh, cohort, uh, previous MI diabetes like this. So the uh, risk factor number uh, calculated and then the com uh, you can see the uh, combination of risk factor more prevalent in Zilba PTX, primary randomization group, significantly like this. So the uh, risk factor mortality analysis like this, uh, you can see the uh, mortality rate decreased with few, fewer risk factor like this. So not, not randomized. So also the uh, um, secondary randomized uh, PTA group, including drug eluting stent patient. Uh, you can see the suboptimal cohort moved to 63 patient drug eluting stent implanted. And then optimal PTA group that the uh, median uh, interval, the 183 days uh, re-intervention at that time that inter intervention drug eluting putting 30 cases. So the uh, primary randomization uh, drug eluting stent 242, but the uh, secondary randomization to 305, and then finally, uh, crossover cases plus 336. So 40% of the patient initially randomized to PTA were actually treated with DES. So the uh, actual treatment analysis, that is uh, like this, uh, mortality analysis, or, uh, all patient analyzed by actual treatment, so no mortality signal exists like this. Uh, also, the risk factor mortality analysis like this, mortality rate decreased with fewer risk factor and no mortality signal for actual treatment like this. So finally, prediction model for uh, freedom from TLR from March study analysis. Uh, not only randomized trial, but also single arm study in uh, three country, more complex region like this, and then the China standard region uh, similar to the RCT, and then post-marketing study, Japan, that the 900 uh, cases enrolled post-marketing survey at all commas study, and the uh, US, uh, the uh, post-approved uh, study, uh, 200 cases. So total number, 2,374 patients treated with the Zilba PTX drug uh, eluting stents. So uh, develop a prediction model to determine the impact of a patient and region factor on freedom from TLR through five years. So the, uh, this is a study characteristics like this. Region lengths are shorter and longer, uh, uh, widely uh, inclusion in this study. So that uh, total uh, 2,027 cases uh, uh, follow up one year freedom from TLR 90.5% and five year 75.2%. And then factor included in procedure model is like this, patient demographics, region characteristics, and then March variate model result like this. Uh, as expected that the CLI region, uh, CLI region lengths and total occlusion have a significant impact on TLR. But uh, other factors such as the diabetes uh, classification did not have a significant impact on TLR. Based on the, this uh, data, uh, we, we make the Zilba PTX predictable model. For example, uh, 60 more than five years of uh, crowd count patient and the region length less than 50 millimeter, reference best of five millimeter, that's a uh, uh, check here, here, here. So uh, 
、ワンイヤー、ツイヤー、スリヤー、フォーイヤー、ワンイヤー、ファイブイヤー、フリーダム、フロム、ピエール、ライト、ライクディス。そうだった、OK、ディスペーシャント、ロングタム、OK、アダダ、ペーシャント、リージョン、レングスだった、モアザン、ワンハンドレッド、サッチカインド、ブタ、ペーシャント、シミュラー、シミュレーション、ワンイヤー、TLR、ナインティトゥ、ファイブイヤー、TLR、セブンティナイン。アンデン、アナダ、ペーシャント、モアザン、ツーハンド、ロングアリージョン、タスク D リージョン、シミュラーアナリシス、ワンイヤー 86%、ファイブイヤー TLR、65%。そう、リスク、ベネフィット、バランス、で、イマージン、アンドゥ、ディ、チョイス、ドラギルティング、ステント。This is the final slide. ファイブイヤーリザルト、コンフラン、ロングタム、スピリオリティ、オブゼルバ PTF、ブラサス、スタンダード、ケア、ノーセーフティー、コンサン、リガーディング、タパクリタクソン。ペーシャントアトリージョン、ファクター、フロム、ファイブグローバルクリニカル、スタディ、ユース、トゥ、デベロップ、アプレディクターモデル、フォーフリーダムフロンティーエルワール。センキュー、ホイワーテンシュン。センキュー、ダクター、ヨコイ。And、uh, next speaker is Lawrence Garcia from、uh, Saint Francis Hospital, United States. And、uh, he'll talk about、uh, uh, PET CLI, Basil 2, and Live PTK for PTK therapy. Dr. Garcia, please. Thank you, Dr. Choi.、Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here for TCTAP again in Seoul, and thank you, the organizers, for inviting me.、Um, what can we learn from BEST CLI, Basil II, and、uh, LIFE BTK for BTK therapies is、um, what I want to discuss. These are all of my disclosures.、Um, why is this difficult? Well, as Bill, I think,、uh, Dr. Gray just、uh, demonstrated, unfortunately, when it comes to above knee data, it really seems to depend on. Patency and walking difficulties as our metric. When we go to below the knee, a lot of our data has been mired in endpoints, the heterogeneity of the subjects, the non uniform nature of wound care, and the type of patient enrolled, whether it be Rutherbecker 3, Rutherbecker 4 and 5, and even Rutherbecker 6.、Um, just as a quick review, when we went below the knee, we have the impact deep data, which was the original. Um, uh, trial uh, of DCB for below the knee, and you saw that the、uh, late lumen loss and the DEB arm、uh, compared with the PT arm was exactly the same. It is not statistically significant, and the 12 month TLR was actually、uh, not much different between the two groups. But what really mired this impact deep was that the safety issue was actually weighted against the DCB, and this is why this device was actually pulled from the market. Well, when you go to Levant, the Levant BTK,、um, it had、uh, some favorability, but not very robust data. And when it went to the FDA panel, the FDA panel voted 2 to 15 against, with one abstention in approving it for its effectiveness.、Uh, more recently, you had the Saval trial from Boston Scientific, which went out and, and tried to do a DES, a relatively long DES, of around six centimeters. Uh, comparing it to PTA, a drug eluding、uh, DES. And it、uh, not only did poorly in primary patency, but actually was worse than PTA alone、uh, in that same patient population. And the primary safety endpoint was, was a wash, so that was not a big、uh, issue, although it did not meet its non inferiority、uh, level. So, fast forward now to a five year trial, which was the best CLI presented in the New England Journal back in 2022 by my colleague Alec Farber、uh, out of、um, Boston. It took five years to enroll the study. 18% of the、um, enrollees were non surgeons, which meant about 82% were uh, uh, vascular surgeons. There was no interventional monitoring committee, no IMC for those who、uh, did the intervention. And of the group that was actually enrolled in endovascular,、uh, there was a 38% crossover from the endo group that has never been defined either in the New England Journal or subsequent、uh, discussions. The primary outcomes were major revision、um, or thrombolysis of a graft、um, that created failure of the graft, not a revision to the graft, which occurs in 15 to 20%,、uh, and not re stenosis in the graft. Those are captured as secondary endpoints. Not as a primary endpoint.、Um, this is a very busy slide. This gives you a dis、uh, description of how difficult it was to enroll these patients.、Uh, they screened a large number of patients to get to these 2,500、uh, patients that were assessed for eligibility. And I'll just zoom in on that top portion of the 2,500. 1,800 underwent randomization. These are the exclusion group. And when you look below that, 
1400 had a single uh, segment of vein graft which was uh, considered appropriate for bypass, for distal bypass. Though, uh, around those that did not have uh, appropriate uh, conduit, about 400 were put into cohort two, so they had to either have uh, alternative grafts or PTFE grafts. Um, let's back up a second. So, whoops. So in this group, you can see the difficulty in what they did with the patient population and how they had to actually move forward with them. In basal two, you could see that the, uh, the difference here was that it was a 10-year study to enroll similar endpoints in male and outcome on both the surgical side as well as the endovascular side. However, the primary outcome of revision not just thrombolysis or failure of graft by way of thrombosis was considered a repeat procedure. And in endo, any restenosis was considered uh, a failure and was considered a, uh, as an outcome. And if you looked at the two groups, only the mortality difference between endo and surgery actually drove a difference between the cohorts. And you can see here that the vein bypass group actually declined early at index and stayed separate throughout the entire cohort at seven years. And then there's a final catch-up, uh, late catch-up by the best endo treatment, which was angioplasty in this group. And a similar outcome on overall survival, it is a wash among both groups early. There's a slight separation between the mid-years and then there is a re, uh, reconnection. Uh, both lines tend to converge after year seven. And if you look back on the risk of mortality, as Bill just showed, the risk of mortality is about one in three patients who are enrolled will be dead in the next four to seven years. So best CLI versus basal two uh, in trial designs, 150 global centers in best, 1,400 segments, uh, subjects were enrolled. Um, you were excluded if you had excessive surgical risk, so this was the best surgical group, and a one-to-one -one randomization uh, by anatomy, um, by presence or absence of BTK disease, and in clinical sense, rest pain versus tissue loss. Whereas basal was 41 uh, primarily uh, United uh, Kingdom centers, 345 subjects, multiple stratifications, and more bypass and endo crossover was 27%. More reintervention in the endo group was 19%. When you look at the two endpoints, best CLI, uh, the composite of death in male, uh, the reintervention need and timing was determined by the site investigator. There's no CDTLR criteria or independent adjudication in best CLI. Basal II was a primary endpoint of amputation-free survival. If you know anything about the data on Belloni um, trials, amputation-free survival is the lowest metric you can ever test against. It's a very simple metric to actually test against. So just very briefly, Bill just went over the life BTK with primary benefit on a very short above knee or below knee uh, scaffold that's bioresorbable. And if you looked at across the subgroups, the subgroups all showed benefit of the bioresorbable scaffold. The endpoints were both primary and a primary secondary endpoint, which were both powered. And so what's in the future? Uh, Bill did touch on uh, some of this with um, uh, R3. Uh, there's a ton of different companies which are coming in, not just uh, bioresorbable stents, which are looking at uh, drug-coated uh, delivery of uh, some device, whether it be balloon or uh, endoprosthetic. So in conclusion, I think the BTK trials are definitely in. They're very, uh, very favorable. But not one group, not industry nor society, and the FDA have generalized to a single patient population to an outcome measure that we need to focus on as to an outcome. And unfortunately, the difficulties with patients, wounds, and endpoints have really allowed no one trial, short of one benefit trial right so far with life BTK, to be successful, but also generalizable and acceptable. The life BTK has changed this landscape, I hope, in a dramatic way, giving us our first victory. But the patient needs that are enrolled in life BTK have been very specific and will not answer the question for the cohort that we see every day in CLTI. But unfortunately, that has to be our first step and our first start. In this environment, both best CLI is a remarkable study a remarkable uh, endeavor, NIH-sponsored trial, that in my opinion has unfortunately missed its mark for the question that it asked. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Garcia. Yeah. Now it's time for open discussion for peripheral intervention issues. Yeah, uh, 
Bill and Larry, I just want to get your perspective. Um, in Los Angeles, two of my peers have actually been contacted by the DOJ to retain emails, texts, phone calls for the past seven years. And so I think there's a heightened awareness and I think they are doing less peripheral interventions for claudication. Have you noticed any similar trends over on the East Coast? In terms of the DOJ? Yeah, or <laughs> just the, the performance of intervascular interventions for, let's say, obviously, uh, critical limb scheme is a different beast, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe for claudication where, yeah. Yeah, listen, um, I was asked, I won't say by whom, but I was asked to review records of a physician who was considered to be potentially abusive with his um, um, uh, self-owned lab, you know. And so in the United States, that is an issue. Uh, and my review of the records was, you know, scurrilous. I mean, it was bad. Um, so I think that it does happen. I don't think it's limited to one specialty. I think there are specialties across the board, vascular surgery, radiology, cardiology. Um, as, I, as I've said, and unfortunately for the audience, this is very much a U.S. problem, but CMS has, has set the cheese in the position that it is in. If they want something to change, they have to move the cheese. Uh, they keep, they keep um, incentivizing people to do things that are not regulated, that are easy to abuse. And uh, it doesn't make it right. I'm not excusing it. But um, I think the fundamental issue is that the, the system of payment is, is a little bit backwards. I think also, especially the OBL ASC Correct. system yeah. for the facility fees, it's very incentivized. And I got to tell you, along, let's say, Ventura Boulevard, for example, there are OBL shops throughout. I have no doubt. Yeah. yeah that, that's, a, that's a really touchy situation in, in the U.S. right now. There was a, a story against a, a, an operator uh, that made it nationwide uh, yeah, information. Times, yeah. and, uh, and it's driven by this OBL market that I think you guys were chatting about. The challenge is, is that as, as one group seeks benefit from that kind of you know, issue, um, they have to look, it's not just one group because when you look at the OBL market, it's driven by one particular specialty in the United States. And, and they seem to be the loudest in regards to their uh, difficulties with, with this whole uh, New, New York Times uh, um, uh, story. So it, it's really, it's a U.S. issue, but it's really a bad issue. I think it's really, it, it gives us a, a, a bad name, but it also does a disservice to our patients is, I guess, what I'm trying to should say. Should guidelines be switched to the point where maybe we should only be treating Rutherford class three if they failed medical therapy and an exercise strategy or, I mean, there's a lot of leeway there. So I can tell you from review of the records that the indications and guidelines will not make a difference. I reviewed the, uh, hundred, uh, I won't say how dozens of records and it was really very much physician generated. It's a little, it's really bad. I, I wanna move off of that for a second because we could do that all day. <laughs> it's a very important subject. Um, you know, uh, uh, Basel III was just reported this week. It was a randomized, randomized trial between DCB, DES, and uh, balloon angioplasty, um, and, and, and stenting as needed in any of those categories. And the, the end point was amputation-free survival. And this was presented at Charing Cross. And I actually stood up at the end, of, I try not to comment on any of these things, but uh, I, had to, I had to challenge the investigators who I have to be, give a lot of credit for finishing these trials. But um, I, I, I said, when I do an intervention in the SFA popliteal, which is what this was testing, I have no illusion that I'm changing mortality. So why, why in God's green earth would you have amputation-free survival as your primary endpoint? In Claudicans. Because it completely swamped any signal that we really want to see, which is what about patency, what about you know, limb salvage, what about those things? And, there's really no answer, and I, and I look at this trial, that trial, Basel III, best CLI, without unadjudicated endpoints, and I say, these are, these are publicly sponsored through National Institutes of Clinical Excellence in England, NIH, and the U.S., that quite honestly, the, uh, the FDA would never have let go forward in, their, in, their structure, in the way they were structured. So I have to put a plug in for industry-sponsored trials, which I think are much more rigorous in terms of endpoint determination. So I just wanted to make a comment. So, but uh, I think that, but basal three was driven towards the clodicant group? Or no, you, it was critical SFA, limb. but critical limb, right? Correct. That's the unique thing. It was SFA, but critical limb. That's very odd. Because they must odd, have concomitant, odd concomitant disease below the knee then. 
one with yeah, the, uh, less than 20% of the people had, had, more, had more work done below the knees. It's weird. Anyway, yes, sir. Yeah, I have one question. And in terms of engineering the bioreservoir bio scaffold, it's always not easy to make the long device. So in, in Korea, several companies are trying to make the bioscaffold devices to use in the below the knee, below the knee reasons, but uh, there is uh, some limitations in the device length. Mm -hmm. So the, it's always not easy to make a long device because the, the overlapping scaffold is not feasible in the below the knee, uh, below the knee reasons. So mm -hmm. I think the, the, the availability of a long device is uh, one people in the uh, real world uh, use of uh, the bio power reservoir scaffold. How about the the situation of the other country or in U.S.? Uh, how long devices are available in the market? Mm. Do you, you know? What's the question? Uh, how long are the de uh, BRS devices that are currently available in the market or will be? Well, so they're not available yet in the U.S. Um, they're, I think Ab uh, <coughs> Abbott will be going to the FDA to get approval. And I keep on hearing that it's pending, but I don't think it's been FDA approved. Well, how long is that device? Do you know? But it's only 36 uh, millimeters right. uh, at its Short. longest, so I think it's. But R3 is longer, I think. And R3 yeah. is is coming out with a longer subset. <coughs> I think it can be you know centimeters long because of the way yeah. they designed that. It's almost like a Supera. You can make it as long as you want. Um, but to your point, you know, and I think Bill really focused on this and did this very well. Is that, you know, when you do these trials, you 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 get a trial to a div to an outcome rather than to the general, generalizability of what you see in the real world. And that's why all these randomized trials always have, a, as I call it, a regression to the smallest lesion length before they actually go to the uh, PMA or the post-market analysis study, which is going to be more a real world experience. You saw it with Zilver uh, back in the day. You know, 54 millimeters was Zilver's original data. Very seminal paper, 2.0 PSVR, and they, it's a very soft landing out to their five years. But yet they had to then do a PMA, which was the longer lesion cohort. They had the Japanese with heavy calcification. Uh, and so those things come after the, the randomized trial. And I think that's the only way that we'll ever know the, the really generalizability of any of these devices. Am I off the mark on No, I that? think you're right. And the other, just to answer the question more specifically, I've seen some other technologies that are not even close to being clinical yet, which will expand the lesion length and allow for longer lesions. Uh, sorry, the scaffold length. Yeah. So, so I think the, the patients with uh, you know PTK disease, especially CRI patients, they have very long lesions, and also the the the, the, the dimensions of the PTK uh, arteries uh, uh, is very small, and so I think the diameter maybe uh, uh, three to you know two millimeters, you know from proximal to distal. So even in coronary disease, coronary artery disease, you know, small stents, they perform poorly, you know, right? uh, you know, than in large vessels. So I think a uh, long bioresorbable stent, I, I don't think it is the right way to go, uh, you know. So more, I think, uh, stentless, scaffoldless, uh, uh, you know, strategy, maybe using, uh, you know, spot stenting or spot scaffold, maybe there is a better way to treat these patients. Well, there's a TAC device in the United States. I don't know if you have that available here. It's a very, very focal uh, implant that works like that. It, you know, it's interesting what to take away from the BTK, life BTK trial. One thing is the sirolimus clearly works. It works in the bioabsorbable. It works in the metal, metallic stents. So sirolimus works below the knee. But the other thing to take away is that, you know, paclitaxel coated balloons have not been successful. Paclitaxel coated stents have not been successful. And the third thing is that um, it may be that, we're, and we'll see because there's a trial for um, sirolimus below the knee actually ongoing now, but we'll see what, that hap what happens with that. But it may be that the scaffolding, so either stent or absorbable, is important for patency in addition to, because to your point, these are small vessels, and any any regression, any any spasm, any right. you know, uh, any loss of of uh, vascular uh, size, is meaningful in terms of longer term patency. So I, I my sense is we're going to start moving toward that conclusion pretty soon. And I'll just add that the you know where coronaries in the meta analysis on imaging has shown benefit is you, there's tons of data now to show that if we do 
imaging, we can have better outcomes. And I think the below knee space is going to be one of those places where imaging is critical, particularly for the bioresorbables and even for drug, drug coated balloons, because I think you're going to have to match what is the true vessel one to one for the scaffold and for DCBs. And so I think that imaging is going to be, and I don't do it very often, and that's the problem, but I think that's going to be the key. Dr. Okoye, I have a question. You showed that the uh, last slide, you showed the uh, prognosis model of silver PTX is very, very interesting. How, how you make the prognosis model of silver PTX? Yeah. Uh, sorry, the, now? Yeah. Silver PTX? Yeah. Long term pro, you. Yes. Uh, uh, and enter the risk factor and, yes, uh, yes. uh, and make uh, the Gilbert PTS prognosis model. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So yes, how, how can you make that kind of model? You, you make? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, uh, uh, not only I, that uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Deik and the Dr. Mm -hmm. many directors gather to the doctor. And that, that, that model that open the uh, Cook uh, homepage mm -hmm. and then easy to download such kind of the data, and based on the more than 2,000 cases that the prediction model mm. puts the Gilbert PTX one year, mm. five year freedom from TLR, that's a very good model, risk mm. benefit balance. Mm. But so, the, yeah, no, yes. That, that, kind, that model uh, make your clinical decision difference? Yes, I think, but the, at that time that the paclitaxel problem exists. So that is the risk benefit balance necessary clinically. Mm -hmm. So we making the, that's kind, such kind of the model. Mm -hmm. But now the, um, yesterday, uh, Dr. Gray presented that the FDA new data analysis, no uh, safety concerning mm -hmm. exists. So that uh, the, uh, the usefulness of the, that uh, kind of the model that the different situation now. But I, I have one question to Dr. Gray and Dr. Garcia. Uh, public tax uh, safety issue uh, disappear, I think. But the, how do you think that the Shirolimus routine drug coating balloon now coming, several company, uh, that the role of the Shirolimus, how do you think that the uh, necessary of Shirolimus coating, public tax only, okay? How do you think that, Dr. Gray? What was, um, what was the question? Shirolimus routine. Oh, what's the yeah. difference? What, who do you think is going to win? Yeah, yeah. Well, below the knee, uh, uh, there's only one winner so far, and that's Sirolimus. Whether it's on a, on a metal stent or a resorbable scaffold, we'll see whether the drug coat of balloon works. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit confusing. Um, mm -hmm. It'll be very interesting to see if Sirolimus on a balloon doesn't work then there's only a couple of options, reasons for that. One is that the excipient didn't allow enough sirolimus to go in, um, it didn't stay long enough in the vessel, or you need the scaffolding in addition to the sirolimus to make the combination uh, effective. And um, I'm, I'm betting on the third one, but we'll see what happens. I don't know what you think. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You're, you know, one, one of the strategics is betting a lot of money on, on the balloon right now, and so, um, that the idea, I would, I'll turn your question back on you just a little bit. I suspect that the initial data that they have out of that one company that's, that's gone over to uh, one of the strategics in the U.S. has very good European data, and I suspect that that's going to be a success, just like BTK, Life BTK was. I think, again, to Bill's point, I think Sirolimus war, wins and works below the knee. The challenge will be, are you going to keep Paclitaxel above the knee? Yeah. Because they're also doing a trial, and it seems to me that if they are if we're playing, you know, our cath labs only have a certain amount of space, and I suspect that if you had just one drug to use, that you're going to find that you're going to use serolimus above the knee and below the knee. You may have just one, one kind of drug uh, to be usable down there. Um, that would probably be the, the next yeah. big question that will be asked. But serolimus above the knee is going to have to have at least three-year patency data advantages. Mm -hmm. And that may be challenging for sirolimus because it's difficult to be in the tissue for that long. Mm -hmm. Not for three years, but long enough to have a long-term yeah. effect. Yeah. So it's going to be very interesting. We won't, we won't have the answer at the one-year mark with the, when the trial is over. It's going to be two and three years when we yeah. understand better right. how to compare to paclitaxel. But yeah, the, but the original um, Scirocco was a complete yeah. wash, right? Yeah. But it was a stent more than it was drug. It, it, there's a lot of play here. But uh, I'm just thinking pragmatically in our cath labs, we're going to end up with 
because you don't have infinite space. And I suspect we're going to end up with one thing. Yeah. I have a question to Dr. Yokoi. Yeah. Yeah, um, you, you know, uh, presented your uh, simple PTX data, but I think uh, nowadays uh, Japanese doctors use more uh, Eluvia. Yes. Than, <laughs> so uh, we uh, conducted, you know, IVOS DCB trial. Mm -hmm. So the, we wanted to investigate the role of IVOS uh, in the use of DCB in, for the femoral proprietary disease, and we found a benefit of IVOS for the uh, intervention. Uh, but, but uh, the, there is a Japanese uh, study, uh, I think it was a registered study done by Dr. Ida, I, I think. He reported that you know, use of IVOS was associated with uh, increased risk of aneurysm or hello sign. Ah, I see, uh, so, I see. Uh, I see. So what do you think about that? So it, it is uh, dangerous <laughs> to use IVOS for the <laughs> intervention using DS? <laughs> what do you think? No, 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 no. That, I think the... Uh, mm, I think the uh, aneurysm formation, uh, uh, best, uh, the reason why the uh, subintimal space, a guide wire go to the subintimal space, mm -hmm. and then larger balloon, mm -hmm. aggressive dilatation post, mm -hmm. that's the reason why not the IBUS uses, <laughs> I think. My, my, <laughs> yeah, we, we actually uh, just published about uh, three or four months ago a meta-analysis of uh, across a patient level meta-analysis looking at a halo sign uh, yeah. with multiple devices and found that really it wasn't unique to alluvia. It was seen in drug coated, it was, it was in silver, it was in alluvia, it was in DCB, it was in ferrimetal stents, it was, so if you look for it, you'll find it and it doesn't seem like it's, first of all, it's not, there's no clinical, you know, nothing bad happens, but it's also more common than we appreciated before. Yeah. yeah. Well, with yeah. that, um, this has been a great session. I, I really enjoy these, uh, opportunities to discuss kind of the pragmatic nature of our data sets. And so for uh, Dr. Choi and myself and for all the panelists and all the speakers, thank you uh, for this session. We'll close it out and enjoy the rest of your day at TCTAP.